Hello again. Uh, welcome back. Uh, this is just a, a separate video from the Sermon on the Night series. If you'd like to check that out, click on the card up at the top. But this past Sunday was Palm Sunday, and I had the privilege and opportunity to, to, to preach out of church. And since it was Palm Sunday, I decided that I would look at one of the passages uh, that discusses, that talks about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, what we often call the triumphal in, uh, entry. And so, in looking at it and looking through all the research and stuff like that, I eventually decided upon looking at Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. And so, this is Matthew's account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's coming to celebrate Passover. He's got other stuff in mind, too. And it, it, this account is told in all four Gospels. Not every story gets that. Uh, it gets treated by all the four Gospel authors. And now each gospel author presents it slightly different, in a slightly different way, and they're emphasizing different aspects by doing so. But what we're going to see today in looking at Matthew, and this shows up in the other, uh, in the other accounts as well, is that Jesus' arrival at Jerusalem is in the style of the coming of the rightful king. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem in the style of the rightful king. So let's take a look at Matthew uh, 21. Verses 1 through 11. Uh, when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So Matthew records this account. But let's set the stage uh, for what's going on in this passage. Ever since the people of Israel, and really just before, but ever since the people of Israel had returned from exile, they had been living under the thumb of some foreign power. Now, God had made promises, though, that there, there would be somebody who would restore them, who would bring the nations under subjection, and who would rule. Now, various groups may have disagreed about all the details, but there were certain things, certain beliefs that they held in common when it comes to the arrival of this promised one. So the Archaeological Study Bible, in one of the articles in there, it lists out five things that these groups held in common. Uh, one, Israel awaited restoration and the divine reversal of all that was wrong in the world. Second, pagan empires and their idols would be cast down and Jerusalem would be glorified. Then corrupt leadership within Israel would be removed and the true Davidic king installed. Then Israel's sins would be forgiven and God would pour out his spirit upon his people so that the nation would become obedient. And as a result, light would go forth from Jerusalem and summon all nations to worship the Lord of all the earth. So they all agreed upon these, these concepts, these things, but they didn't all agree about the details, the timing, whether there would be a one Messiah or two Messiahs. They didn't really agree on everything. But with this, now, so the people had these expectations, but they had not heard from God in, in about 400 years. And yet they maintained this hope uh, that throughout coming under one power, throughout in another power, they maintained this hope that God would act, that he would come and bring restoration. So when would, when would God act? When, when would this happen? How long before the promised one, the Messiah, would come? So many people claimed to be the Messiah. They rose up, they sought power, and they all failed. So when was God going to do this great work? Well, then came uh, a man baptizing in the Jordan River. John the Baptist is what we call him. That's what he's called. And he was baptizing in the Jordan River, and he was preaching a message. And that message was, 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the style of the old prophets, he is making this thing. He's teaching. He's baptizing people. And so they asked him, are you? Are you the one? And he was like, no, I'm not the one. I, I am the forerunner. I'm the one who's coming before the Messiah. And then Jesus comes along and John points to him. Jesus comes along and he preaches that same message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then word about him spread. As Matthew uh, 4, 23 through 25 tells us, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those who were suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds uh, followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So not only is Jesus preaching the kingdom, that the kingdom of God is here, he is proving it. These healings and these exorcisms, these miracles, were all signs, were all evidence that the kingdom of God had come. That the kingdom of God had come. And those who suffered were being delivered from the bondage that they were under, whether it was a sickness, whether it was a demonic. They were being freed and delivered from their bondage. In Luke 4, Jesus, he, he speaks, he, he reads from Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then after he read from that, he sat down, and then he tells the people who were in the synagogue there, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So after so many years of waiting with this expectation that God was going to move and send this Redeemer, this Messiah, here was a man proclaiming the arrival of the kingdom of God, teaching with authority, unlike their teachers, and providing evidence in the forms of healings and exorcisms. Now, crowds followed Jesus, some hoping not only for healing, but that this, indeed, he was the Messiah who would deliver them from outside rule, who would establish a restored Israel. And yet, time and again, though, Jesus rebuffed their attempts. And scripture is clear about this. He did this because it was not time yet. Then, third year of Jesus' ministry rolls around. It is about to be Passover. Jesus turns his face towards Jerusalem. And it is finally time. Jesus travels through Jericho and begins making his way up the road toward Jerusalem. And that's when and where today's passage takes place. And there are two movements that we can see in this account. First, we have the fulfillment of prophecy in verses 1 through 7. And then the second is the kingly procession in verses 8 through 11. So the fulfillment of prophecy takes place in verses 1 through 7. I'm not going to read it again. Uh, you can look that up. But in essence, Jesus tells two of his disciples to go and retrieve a couple of animals, a donkey and her colt, from a nearby, nearby village with some instructions as to what to say if someone asks. The disciples go and return with the animal. Now, Matthew is the only one to mention uh, two animals. Uh, the other accounts merely mention a colt. This contradiction, put that in quotes because it's not really one, uh, has been discussed by scholars, the various different ideas as to why is Matthew doing his doubling thing, which some author, some scholars claim that Matthew doubles everything. Uh, or, or is there something on, going on here? What's going on? The most sensible idea, uh, solution, if you will, is that there were two animals, and that Matthew records the two animals, whereas the other Gospels merely focus upon the one that Jesus rode. The Mark and Luke tells us that this colt was an animal that had never been ridden by anyone. Now, it might have borne a, a burden or something like that, but it had never been ridden by anyone. So some commentators like to point out, or would point out that, you know, bringing the, the colt's mom along was probably a, a good idea. It would, it would keep the animal calm. It would keep the, the colt calm in the present, be, be calm in the presence of his mother. So that's the most sensible thing I've heard about. 
Now, in any case, this wasn't some happenstance occurrence. Matthew and John tells us that this was to fill a, pro a prophecy, in particular, Zechariah 9.9. 9. Now, did the disciples recognize all that was going on? Did they, they get it clearly? John tells us, no, they didn't. It wasn't until after the resurrection. But Jesus knew what was going on, and, it's some, and as we'll see, the crowds kind of caught on to it, and the Pharisees definitely knew about it, what he was claiming. Now, why was it important that Jesus ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, besides fulfilling prophecy? Well, there are three things to note, uh, and I think that they need to be taken together. Jesus is making a statement, and these three things are all brought into that. First, in the ancient Near East, donkeys were the mounts of royalty. You can go look at Judges 10.4, Judges 12.14, 2 Samuel 16.2, and again in 18.9. And in 1 Kings 33 and 38, the, the author there points out that as part of Solomon's coronation and his anointing as the rightful king, he rode David's mule. Uh, he, he was anointed at the Gihon Spring, which is at the gate by the Mount of Olives. And by riding into Jerusalem this way, Jesus is making an explicit claim to kingship. Now, the second thing is Jesus is also playing into messianic expectations. The Zechariah 9-9 passage was considered as pointing to how the Messiah would appear. And this, this passage, or this verse, is tied to two other verses in the Old Testament. In Genesis 40, verse 11, it's tied to Jacob's prophecy over Judah, where he says, He ties his, vol, his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. It's also linked to Isaiah 62, 11. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, Say to the daughter of Zion, Lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Jesus is proclaiming that the time of the messianic, messianic restoration has begun. Now, the third thing is many have seen Jesus riding on this donkey as a, as a highlight of the humility of Jesus. He didn't ride into Jerusalem on a war horse. He didn't come in a chariot. Uh, he didn't come in warfare. The Zechariah passage, Zechariah 9, notes the gentleness of the rider. And Jesus did indeed come humbly. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 points out Jesus' humility in leaving behind the glory of heaven and becoming one of us and being obedient to the point of death. And Paul uses Jesus' humility as an example for us. Another thing, though, is when this word is used in reference to kings, it also refers to their graciousness and their mercy. And Jesus was on a mission of grace. That's, what's gonna, that's what the cross is all about. God is being gracious and making a way for us to be with him. And Jesus, throughout his ministry, had shown both mercy and grace throughout it. So all three of these concepts should be taken together. Jesus is coming as a king, fulfilling the messianic prophecies, and he's not coming as a conquering king. He's coming with grace in mind. Jesus is making a statement about who he is. Now, he had previously avoided the spotlight uh, as Messiah, but now he is beginning to make a statement with his actions, and this cannot be forgotten. Now, the animals by themselves, riding, this being on the colt, don't make the statement. Jesus must ride the colt into Jerusalem. And this brings us to our second movement in the Matthew 21 passage, and that is the kingly procession. Now, the people spread their coats on the road. They're cutting branches and laying them in the road. And the, the crowds are, are shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The city is stirred, and people are asking what's going on to say this is all about Jesus. Brief synopsis of those verses. So Jesus is coming into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, and he's not the only one to do so. Uh, the population of Jerusalem at this time more than tripled, going from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. And as Jews made their way from all over to celebrate this, 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 this festival, and they would often sing what is known as the Hallel, which consists of Psalms 113 through 18 as they made their way to Jerusalem. And usually Psalm 118 was sung on the final leg as they're in Jerusalem and making their way into the temple, to the temple. But here in the passage today, we see something slightly different. The crowds see Jesus 
who many of have at least heard of, remember words spread about him throughout the whole area, and some of whom had perhaps even seen him perform miracles or heard him teach. And he's riding on a donkey, and many of these people begin to put two and two together. And not only those things, he is coming from the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives played a, a particular role in the Messianic understandings of the time. Zechariah 14.4 reads, In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move to the north and the other half to the south. Now, this, this verse in its context led to the expectation that the Messiah would come to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And this understanding can be seen in, in the multiple times people who claimed kingship or authority or, or who were coming, such as Alexander the Great, came to Jerusalem from the east, from the Mount of Olives. Now, the crowds recognize the uniqueness of this situation, and they throw their cloaks down on the road before Jesus. This echoes 2 Kings 9.13, where after Elisha anoints Jehu as king over the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, each of Jehu's servants asks, what's going on? And Jehu explains. And so what his servants do is they took his, each took his garment and placed it on the bare steps and blew the trumpet saying, Jehu is king. Now, not only do, is their cloaks being thrown down, Matthew mentions that they were spreading branches on the ground. John tells us that they're palm branches. Now, palm branches were often used in triumphal processions, and they were a common symbol for victory throughout the ancient world from Rome and Greece into uh, this area of the Middle East. And so there's victory here. And there's also something else, too. The rabbis tell us that palm branches were shaken in combination with the leaves and branches of some other plants uh, as Psalm 118.25 was being recited. And... This is, this is the psalm that the crowds were singing and shouting as they went before Jesus. So from Psalm 118, verses 22 through 29, that, the whole section there, reads, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Now, the Psalms uh, do not ascribe an author to Psalm 118. You know how in uh, some Bibles, you have the little subscription there right underneath the, the title of the psalm that kind of tells you maybe who written this is a psalm of David or a psalm of Asaph. Well, the psalms don't do that for this psalm. But by the time of the first century, uh, Psalm 118 had been associated with David. And in particular, the period after his son Absalom's rebellion and death, when David, when David is restored as king, as he enters through the eastern gate of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, although he is walking on barefoot, you know, uh, because of all the things that's going on. But the connection with kingship is here again emphasized. Now, Matthew, as well as Luke and John, instead of translating do save, instead leave it in the Hebrew Aramaic, Hosanna. It means God save us now. Now, something to remember is that biblically speaking, salvation is linked to deliverance, is linked to victory. Now, by the time of Jesus, some think that this cry uh, for salvation had turned to a shout of victory, moving from God saved to God is victorious. And it's thought that the decision on the part of the gospel writers was to emphasize this aspect, this, this victorious of it, victoriousness of it, especially in light of the celebratory nature of this procession into Jerusalem. Now, we see this imagery that's associated with this uh, procession again in Revelation 7, 9 through 10. After these things I looked, John said, and behold a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the Lord, sitting before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
Salvation in this passage here too carries that concept of victory. God is the one who saves. He is the one who delivers. He is the one who provides the delivery. The victory. <laughs> and the delivery. Now, to this quote of Psalm 118, 25 and 26 that we have in Matthew, Matthew adds the words, Hosanna in the highest. This is a shout of victory. It's a shout of praise. Luke doesn't use the word Hosanna, but instead says, peace and glory, uh, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And that calls to mind the angel choir that Luke talks about over in Luke 2, where they, when they announce Jesus' birth, they, they sing, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now Mark adds to the quotation, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And John makes the addition of even the king of Israel. So what we're seeing in all the Gospels, what we're seeing in all the accounts, is this connection to kingship. We cannot forget Jesus not only proclaims the kingdom, he is coming as the rightful king. Now another Old Testament echo is found in verse 11. Verse 11 reads, When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, a similar incident occurred at the coronation of Solomon when he was crowned king. Now, David's son and Solomon's brother, Adonijah, decided that he should be king after David. And he had one of the priests and others of the court help him. They held a coronation ceremony and he threw a banquet. Now, David had no idea. He was unaware of this until Nathan the prophet came and told him. And uh, when he learned of it, he, with the prophet Nathan and, a, and a, a high priest, set up a coronation for Solomon, making it official that he was the one to inherit the throne. So 1 Kings 1, 40-45 talks about the reaction to this. So after Solomon is crowned at the Gihon Spring, riding David's mule before being taken back towards the temple, all the people went after him. And the people were playing on flutes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth shook at their noise. Now Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they finished eating. When Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, Why is the city making such an uproar? While he was still speaking, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest, came. Then Adonijah said, Come in, for you are a valiant man, and bring good news. But Jonathan replied to Adonijah, No. Our lord King David has made Solomon king. The king has also sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and they have made him ride on the king's mule. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king in Gihon, and they have come up from their rejoicing so that the city is in an uproar. This is the noise which you have heard. So you see that echo from Solomon's procession and the stir it created to Jesus' procession and the stir that it creates. And Jesus' procession is indeed a kingly one, with everything calling attention to the fact that Jesus is entering Jerusalem as its king, as the Messiah, the anointed one of God, come to restore Israel. And this is captured by all the gospel writers in their various accounts. The thing is, the triumph isn't to last. Some even call this the a triumphal procession because nothing happened, nothing good happened, nothing, nothing celebratory exactly happens immediately thereafter. Jesus' conflict with the religious leaders in Jerusalem ramps up. He gets in discussions with them more and more. And they'd already plotted to kill him, but now they're even more determined to do so. Jesus is then betrayed by Judas. He's arrested and taken before Pilate and Herod. Now Pilate, point blank, asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, simply says, it is as you say. Now, John records a slightly different response, and Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. Then Jesus is beaten. He's mocked. He is crowned with a crown of thorns smashed down upon his head. He is taken to the cross. He is crucified with a plaque above it saying, This is the king of the Jews. And then he dies, and he's buried. The triumph that was promised when Jesus entered in Jerusalem has been eclipsed by darkness. The disciples despaired and all hope seemed lost. But then, on the third day, the tomb was found empty. Jesus had been resurrected. He was alive again and he was no longer dead. Hope springs forth once again and only then do things begin to come clear to the disciples. 
While the expectation of the Messiah had been focused on a military conquest and the nation of Israel, Jesus had the bigger picture in mind. His conquest was not military, but spiritual. His enemy wasn't Rome, but the devil. The restoration would not be just Israel, but of the whole world. He is the king of a kingdom that is not limited by earthly borders. It would extend from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And one day Jesus is going to come again. And this time he is not riding on a donkey as the Redeemer King, but he is coming on a white horse, coming this time as a conquering king. From Revelation 19 verses 11 through 16, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now what, is, what does all this mean for us today? What, what is this passage? What's the context? What does it all mean for us? First, we need to remember who it is that we serve. We serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Messiah, the Anointed One of God who is bringing restoration, and He is the Victorious One. He brings the victory. He has the victory. Second, we live in dark times that grow ever darker. Just look at the world around us. It's not getting better. It's not going to. Not yet. But in the midst of the darkness that's out there, in the midst of the world, we can rest in the hope that is the true light of the world who lives within us. Nothing the enemy of the world can throw at us can separate us from the love of God. One day the enemy will, will be judged, the world will be restored, restored, death will be no more. Now right, right now though, sometimes it feels like we're living between Friday and Sunday, between the resurrection and the crucifixion. Sometimes we despair. But we don't have to. We know what's going on. We know that Jesus is coming back. And we know that he has us. We need to maintain hope in him. We need to be certain that God will keep his promises. Now, the third, the third thing we need to do is we need to share the hope that we have with the world. We serve the King of Kings, and each one of us plays a part in expanding God's kingdom in this world. And this is done when we share the good news of Jesus, who he is, and what he has done. Now, believer, watching this video, you're, you're a believer. It's easy to let the worries of the world distract us, or to cause us to forget uh, the hope that we have. It's easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle and the hectic pace of life, and, and to just to even become afraid at what's going on. But we don't have to. We don't need to. We need to turn our eyes to Jesus and, and, and exercise faith that is trust in him. We need to live as bright and shining stars in the midst of this, as Paul put it, crooked and ver perverse generation. Jesus never said that we would have it easy. But we can only find comfort in him as we stand firm in him. Now, friend, if you have never trusted Jesus to save you, if you never have come to him and given your life to him, I want you to know that today is the day and now is the time. Whenever you're watching this video, today is the day, now is the time. He wants to save you from your sins, those sins that separate you from God. He wants to save you from that. He wants to deliver you from evil that is over you. Victory is only found in him, and true hope, hope that lasts, can only be found in him. He wants a relationship with you because he loves you. He loves you. And his love is like that of no other. Now, all that you have to do, it's not a checklist, it's not keeping a list of rules, it's not doing things by good works, it's not being a good person. All that you have to do is to trust in him. 
Trust in him. Give your life to him. Now, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, and now is the time. One day Jesus is coming back, and then it's going to be too late. And if you have a question about what it means to give your life to Jesus, or how do you go about doing that, please make a, make a comment below this video. Just please give your life to Jesus. Please trust in him today. He is the only way.